got your Bibles with you. Uh, it's actually, I'm very excited. Turn to Romans chapter 3. We made it. We made it to a new chapter. So praise God for that. Well, while you're turning, just by way of reminder, a few weeks ago we saw in chapter 2, verse 17, where the Apostle Paul turned his attention specifically to the Jewish people. Uh, there, there's no Gentiles in these verses. It is absolutely the Jewish people. And as Paul is continuing to explain the gospel and, and teach us uh, in depth how the gospel works, the bad news applies to the Jewish people just as much as it does to the Gentile. And they didn't believe it. They believed that because of their heritage, that is being Abraham's descendants, they were automatically right with God. And as we've been studying and learning, a physical descendant of Abraham does not make them a spiritual descendant of Abraham. That's exactly what Jesus was trying to teach the Pharisees, that they may have been Abraham's descendants physically, but they rejected the faith that he had in God that made him righteous. They rejected all of it, and Jesus was trying to explain to them, you must have that type of faith to be a true child of God, a true descendant of Abraham. And they was trying to kill Jesus, which was something Abraham would have never done. And we also studied that they were the recipients of the law. But what they failed to understand was that law applied to them first. It applied to them first. And we're, we're going to see a little bit of that today. They believed it applied to everybody else. They, they somehow got a pass on that. And they had a very unique relationship with God. But none of that done them any good in order to achieve the righteousness that is needed for salvation. They did not believe they had sin to repent of. They did not believe that they needed to humble themselves before God in order to achieve the righteousness that only God could give them. And in verse 18, we saw where Paul explained further, they know his will. They even approve of the things that are essential being instructed out of the law. And we discovered and discussed that knowledge alone does not save. Knowledge is the beginning of salvation. But that knowledge of who God is and who we are must lead to repentance. It must lead to faith. So salvation does indeed begin with the mind and with knowledge, but if it doesn't reach the heart, well then true salvation cannot take place. Even though you may know the Bible, if it has not penetrated the darkness of sin that you live in, that knowledge has done you no good at all. And Paul in verses 19 through 20 even pointed out that they taught others they knew the standard enough to teach others, but the problem was they wasn't obeying it themselves. Uh, so to speak, they were saying don't trespass, but they would trespass. They would say don't steal, but they were stealing. And we discussed how, how Paul pointed that out to them. And then really the bombshell Paul dropped on them was in verses 25 through 29. And in verse 29, he pointed out that he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. That is, it's the work of God, not, not the work of the law itself. It is God using the law to accomplish the intended purposes that he has, which we will eventually begin to discuss when we discuss the relationship between the law and faith. We come to see that faith is the actual fulfillment of the purpose of the law. But what Paul was pointing out here was that this righteousness is done by the Spirit of God, not by the letter. It is not done by religious activity. Therefore, that praise comes from God, not from man, because it was all the work of God. And everyone that is truly born again, that has exercised repentance and faith, gives God the glory, as opposed to saying, look how good I am. Look at all the rules that I follow. I'm a good person. But inwardly, they absolutely miss it. And that was a bombshell for, for the Jewish people. For Paul to say, oh, by the way, guess what? You're not really a Jew unless you have been born again and repent and have correct faith in God. You're, you're not really a Jew. The true Jew, the truly chosen of God, are the ones that belong to him in the spiritual sense, not the physical. Now, of course, this would have brought up some uh, disagreements, to say the least on behalf of the Jewish people. And again, Paul anticipates this. He anticipates the argument that they would have said, well, Paul, what good is it to be a Jew? What, what, what advantage is it? We're no different than anybody else. You're saying that a Gentile, it is just as, as good as we are, uh, and, and that we're down where they are, and there's no difference 
whatsoever. Being God's chosen people means nothing. Having all the promises of the Old Testament means nothing. It's not true. Paul, you're saying God has lied to the entire nation of Israel, everybody that's a Jew, and you're saying that that uh, I, I have to I have to repent of something that I don't even believe applies to me. What what good is it to be a Jewish person, Paul? What's your point? Well, Paul begins to to make that uh, argument, and in chapter three, verse one, actually, you know what? Let's read these first eight verses, and then we'll we'll break we'll we'll break it down because what we're going to deal with is the advantage of being God's people, but how they misunderstood it. The advantage of God's promises, but how they misunderstood it, which led Paul to defend the purity of God. So let's read our eight verses, and then we'll, we'll attempt to break them down. Chapter 3, verse 1. What then, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if through my lie, the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. And then in verse 9, he asks the question, what then are we better than that? He moves to another group of people, but we'll close with that. So if you look at verse 1, he asks the question, then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. There is great advantage to being God's people. Paul isn't denying that. At no point has Paul ever denied that there's not advantage to being a Jew. There's not advantage to being uh, of the nation of Israel. The first thing he points out is that, first of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. That is, they was entrusted with the word of God, not just the law. The word oracles here points towards all of the Old Testament writings. They was entrusted with prophecies. That is Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel. They was entrusted with the wisdom writings, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Yes, they were also entrusted with the law. They was entrusted with the Psalms, the great Psalms of Psalms of David, of King David, and, and there were other Psalms, some by Moses, and they was entrusted with all of these. Understanding the Word of God, we know that with the oracles of God, with the Word of God, we are being entrusted, introduced to salvation. The Jewish people were the first one to be able to, to read, and if they would pursue God, comprehend to a degree his plan of salvation. God entrusted that to them first. He entrusted it to them first. The Gentiles did not have access immediately to, to these truths. They had everything they needed for salvation. They had everything they needed for life. God had given them in his word everything they needed to be a blessed nation above every other to have blessed lives, blessed homes, to have the peace in their heart that only God could give. And as we were discussing earlier, as trials and tribulations come into their life, they had everything they needed in the Word of God to be able to endure those trials with peace, with joy, with confidence in God. They had everything they needed for the future. They could, they could understand to a degree, as God gave them understandings, the prophecies of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, that spoke of the suffering servant. They had everything they needed in the word of God. But the problem was they ignored the points of responsibility as individuals and focused only on the blessings. You see, that's where the Jewish people got it wrong. They focused only on the blessings, but they ignored all the other parts of repentance, a life of obedience, being faithful unto God. 
You see, loved ones, that's why it's so important we receive the whole counsel of God. If all I do is present to you the good stuff, well, I'm doing you a great disservice. And if all you search for is the good stuff, the health, the wealth, the prosperity, give me the blessings, but don't tell me anything about sanctification. Don't tell me anything about repentance. I don't want to hear those types of things. Well, then you're going to end up falling into the same trap the Jewish people fell into. You may very well believe a false salvation where you believe that I sign a card or I go to the altar. or If I do something, then I'm automatically in. You are certainly going to miss out on the strength and the, and the wisdom that God can give you for the trials in life. You're certainly not going to grow to be Christ-like. You are not going to grow to be Christ-like if you don't have an understanding of what the Bible teaches about our need for humbleness, for humility, for a perception, a worldview that only God can give through his word. We can't go through life with uh, rose-tinted glasses. And if we study the whole counsel of God, it won't allow us to do that. But the Jewish people wanted only the blessings, but they wanted nothing of repentance nothing of sanctification, nothing of a life of obedience. We don't have time to go through it, but boy, don't we see that today. Your best life now. All health, wealth, and prosperity. But there's no teaching of the cross or of sanctification or of repentance of sin. There's no teaching of that. And it began with the Jews, not with Joel Osteen. He's just following this line of thought as all the others are. So it, it's a great advantage to be a Jew because you were giving first before anyone else the very word of God, the oracles of God. Secondly, they were a nation that were pursued by God like no other. No other nation can say God chose us. God set his love upon us. No other nation can say that. Oh boy, wouldn't it be great to be able to say that? Hey, I'm God's chosen nation. I'm, I'm, I'm part of this. And, and God pursued them and chased them and loved them and cared for them. But they kept rejecting him and running from him and going to idols and rejecting faith and rejecting everything God wanted them to do in order to live a life of blessing and obedience and purity and a relationship with him like no other. He chased them like no other nation. Isaiah 5. Turn with me. Put your, put your finger in, in Romans. And turn with me to Isaiah 5. This is a perfect illustration of this. Isaiah chapter 5. It's the parable of the vineyard. We'll just look at it in part. I want to show you what God did for the nation of Israel. Isaiah 5. Everybody there? You see, when you hear the pages stop turning, you know everybody's there. You can't do that with a phone, can you? You can't do that with a phone. Okay, the pages quit turning. Isaiah 5, verse 1. Let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. That is, God had the nation of Israel. Israel is the vineyard. On a fertile hill, he dug it all around, removed its stones, planted it with the choicest vine, and he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes. Look at all the work he's doing for the vineyard, clearing out the stones, clearing out the property. He's putting the best vines in it. He's not settling for good enough. He, he's putting the best he can possibly find. If you've ever cleared property, you know how hard a job that is. That's hard work to clear property and to prepare a vineyard. And he's preparing the, the soil by removing the stones and giving it the choicest vine, building a tower, hewed out a wine vat in it, all this work that he puts into it. Isn't it reasonable to expect good grapes? All the work I put into it, I, I should have a reasonable expectation for good produce. But notice at the end of verse 2, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, 
judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? God is asking the question, what more could I have possibly done for you as a nation? Yet you rejected me. Yet you pursued idols. Yet you did not repent. Yet you did not live a life of obedience that I called you to. After everything that I've done for you, God pursued them like no other nation. Keep a, keep a bookmark in Isaiah. It's close to where we're going to go to uh, here in a little while. He pursued them like no other nation. Thirdly, the Messiah came through the Jewish people. The Messiah came through the nation of Israel. Man, what an advantage. You were not only God's chosen people in the sense that you were his chosen nation. You were his chosen people that Jesus himself was going to come through. The Savior of the world. The one that was going to bring salvation came from you. What a great advantage. But when Jesus came onto the scene, it said what? His own people didn't even know him. His own people rejected him. That's a reference to the, to the nation of Israel. That's the Jewish people. The light came into the world, and the Jewish people that the light was supposed to be for rejected it. Rejected the light. Next, not only that, not only did the Messiah come through them, but mark this, they were the first ones invited to the kingdom. They were the first ones. Jesus said on a number of occasions, salvation is for the Jew first and then the Gentile. They were the first ones that were offered salvation. The parable of the, of the wedding feast where the king told his slaves, go out and the wedding feast is ready. The meal has been prepared. Everything is set up. Go out and get the people and bring them in. So the slaves went out and what did they say? Well, I just bought some property. I need to go check it out. Well, I can't come. I just purchased some ox. I need to test. If you look at their excuses, their excuses are ridiculous because nobody buys oxen without testing them first. They didn't buy no oxen. They just didn't want to go. Well, I, I bought some property. I need to go check it. How foolish are you to buy property and you haven't even looked at it yet? See, their excuses were flimsy. They didn't go. And it enraged the king. So the king said, fine, go out into the highways and the byways. Get the drunkards. Get, get the ones, get the ones that, that society has given up on. Bring them into my house and my house will be full for my son's wedding feast. Israel was the first one invited to the kingdom and they rejected God's offer. So, the misunderstanding that the Jewish people had as the advantage of being God's people, yes, the advantages were great. Paul never said that they weren't, but their misunderstanding was they viewed being God's people as a privilege only. Paul viewed being God's people as a responsibility to God and to the world to present to them the way of salvation, to present to them by example a life of obedience unto God and show the world this is what God can do, not only in you as an individual. Look what God can do in a nation that humbles themselves before him, that they calls upon his name, that lives in obedience unto his law and unto his word. Oh, not perfectly. And we're going to talk about this more when we get there, but we serve a God of grace. We serve a God of grace, but they were to be the example, but the Jewish people believed because they were God's chosen people well, were entitled. See, it went to their heads, and we talked about that last week. That doesn't apply to us. Paul saw it as a responsibility. They saw it as a privilege only, which is why they misunderstood what Paul was teaching. Secondly, Paul defends the advantages of God's promises. Notice what it says in verse 3. Paul says, What then? If some did not believe, that is, if there were some Jewish people that, that did not believe, uh, their unbelief will not nullify the fullness of God, will it? You see, what they're saying is, well, if I don't believe the way you're saying, Paul, if I don't follow this law of faith that you keep talking about what you're saying, the promises in the Old Testament don't apply to me. You're saying that because I'm a Jew that I'm not automatically in? Well, here's the first thing we need to understand. God is faithful, and the Bible says his promises are yes and amen. Paul never said God's promises didn't hold true. 
Paul never said that your unbelief will nullify the promises of God. He never said that once. And when we understand the promises of God and how they do and do not apply, it'll help us understand these verses. Now, on one hand, we know that the Bible, the Bible has promises. And the Bible says that God, the promises of God are yes and amen. That is, God is faithful. Peter said in 2 Peter that God's promises are precious and magnificent. Precious and magnificent. Paul was a Jew, or Peter was a Jew too. And he exclaimed the promises of God were wonderful. Is it not true in our own lives the promises of God have held true? Is it not true that we can come to the Bible and get a hold of the real promises, not the made-up, man-made promises, the real promises of God, and they prove true every single time? I like what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, man's promises, even at their best, are like a cistern which holds but a temporary supply. But God's promises are as a fountain, never emptied, ever overflowing, so that you may draw from them the whole of that which they apparently contain, and they shall be still as full as ever. In other words, we cannot deplete God when it comes to his promises and him keeping his promises. Oh, the, the Jewish people had wonderful and amazing promises from God. Simply amazing promises from God. And, and so do we. But here's the misunderstanding. Nowhere in the Old Testament does God promise security and blessing apart from repentance and faith. As a matter of fact, we, I, I, could, I could amend that. Nowhere in the Bible does God promise security and blessing apart from repentance and faith. Because you see, what we're dealing with are conditional and unconditional promises. And if you can't tell the difference between the two, you're going to end up in a world of trouble because you're going to believe God is promising you something that the Bible doesn't promise you. So just as, just as an example, if we come to the Bible and we saw where God told Abraham, you're going to have a child in your old age, a child of promise in your old age. I'm not too sure people in their 80s can go, that's a promise for me. I'm going to have a youngin'. Uh, uh, God promises, there it is. So, honey, we better get busy. I, you know, I probably not going to happen. There may be a miracle, but chances are you're going to be disappointed because that's not a promise from that was a promise to Abraham, and it was an unconditional promise. Let me show you the conditional promise that God gave to Israel, not only as a whole but as individuals. Turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Chapter 30. Chapter 30. Chapter 30. <clears throat> and while you're turning there, I just want to preface, these are not verses that promise salvation. These are not verses that promise you're a bit. 15, it says this. It says, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, his commandments, individual and nation, statutes and judgments, individual and nation, that you may live and multiply. And that the Lord your God may bless you in the land when you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants by loving the Lord your God by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him for this is your life and the length of your days that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham Isaac and Jacob to give to them you see we have here conditional promises God is saying if you do this this will be the result but if 
you don't, well then this will be the result. Is it not true today that God still looks at his children and says, if you do this, I can promise you peace in your heart, peace in your mind. I can promise you a particular outcome of blessing. But if you don't, well, then the result is going to be turmoil, anxiety, no peace, anger, bitterness, all these other things. If you do this, I promise you a healthy, vibrant marriage. Oh, not one without, not one without troubles, not one without the ups and downs, but as a whole, is it not true that our marriages go better when we're being obedient to this word as opposed to not? If you go to work and you work the way I call you to and you're an employee the way that I call you to be an employee, is it not true that you will be better off on the job site with your boss as opposed to if you go in and do the opposite of what God says? God says be submissive. God says be a hard worker. God says mind your own business. If you go into work and you're minding other people's business and you're not doing your job and you're a complainer, it's not going to go well for you. Your boss is not going to appreciate it. So that's the idea here. There's conditional promises in the Bible where God says, if you do this, this will happen. The few unconditional promises made in the Old Testament were made as a promise to the nation as a whole, not individual Jews. The promises we just read here are for individual Jews. But the unconditional promises that God made were made to the nation as a whole, not to individual Jews. Notice in verse 4 in Romans. We can turn back there now. Look at what Paul says. In verse 3, he says, What then if some did not believe their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God? Well, at verse 4, may it never be, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. God is going to keep his promises to Israel. The people that Paul was speaking to was going to argue that you're saying none of this applies to us. We've got all of these promises for the nation of Israel. I'm of the nation of Israel. Paul, you can't tell me it doesn't apply to me. And Paul is saying it doesn't apply to you as an individual, but the promises you're looking at apply to the nation as a whole, and God is going to be faithful to the nation of Israel. Because when the day comes that somebody says God's not going to keep his promise, God absolutely will. Therefore, it says that man will be found a liar, but God will be found true. In other words, there's going to come a day where God's going to go, see, I told you I would keep my promises to the nation of Israel because many of them hasn't been fulfilled yet. Many of the promises God made to Israel as a nation are still yet to be fulfilled. And if you try to take those national promises and make them an individual promise, you miss everything God is saying. Turn to chapter 11 of Romans, and I want to show you something real quick. This is referring, by the time Paul gets to chapter 11, he has dealt with the doctrine of election. He has dealt with the true Israel. And in chapter 11, verse 1, he says, I say then... God has not rejected his people, has he? That is the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. God is always faithful to have a remnant of his people everywhere. Everywhere. And that includes the nation of Israel. The, the partial hardening that's taken place to Israel was not every Jew there is. God has his remnant. God has his chosen people that he has called out of that nation. That is the true nation of Israel. And the promises that God has made to Israel as a nation, as a whole, largely is going to be fulfilled in the millennium. 
is going to be fulfilled in the millennium because the purpose of the book of Revelation is for God to purify the nation of Israel to draw and call his chosen people to him once and for all as a nation purified and that's when these promises will take place. Let me show you. Zechariah 8, 7 through 8 says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am going to save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. And I will bring them back, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. This is a clear call of the uh, millennial kingdom where God is going to call his people from the east, from the west, bring them back, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem in the millennial reign where Christ is on the earth and he is ruling for a thousand years and then the new heaven and the new earth comes and Israel will be uh, put back into their place of prominence in the millennial reign as God originally ordained but they failed. God will keep his promise and he will draw them and call them and they will be a nation of prominence again. Jeremiah 33 Behold, and this is prophesying of the millennial reign Behold, I will bring to it health and healing and I will heal them, and I will reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel, and will rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned against me and by which they have transgressed against me. It will be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory, before all the nations of the earth, which will hear of all the good that I do for them, and they will fear and tremble because of all the good and all the peace that I make for it. This is another promise to the nation of Israel as a whole, not the individual Jew. So God is absolutely going to keep his word. God is absolutely going to pour out these promises onto Israel. And that's why Paul said, let God be found true and every man a liar. Loved ones, we're the ones on trial, not God. We don't put God on trial when we say, you haven't kept your promise. Don't say that, otherwise you will be found a liar and God will be found true. And he's quoting Psalm 51, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. In other words, when man tries to judge God, God will prevail and his words will be justified. Now this brings about Paul's defense of God's purity. Uh, notice verse 5. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. In other words, what, what Paul is saying here is the, the twisted logic of the people he's dealing with now is, is not even close to being spiritual. It's not even close to having the mind of God. It's as human as human can get. And he says, verse 6, may it never be, for otherwise how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil, that good may come. So th this, is, this is a lot of words that Paul is using here. Uh, that can that can seem confusing. Let me see if I can simplify it for you. There were people that were so bent on their sin, they were so opposed to what Paul was saying uh, in the gospel that they needed to repent and that they were sinful and that the promises of God are indeed true, but it's not to every individual Jew because not every individual Jew is a person and people of God, that they went so far as to say, okay, well then that means my sin glorifies God because it reveals how gracious and merciful he is. If I don't sin, God has no opportunity to show how good he is. If I don't sin, God has no opportunity to show how gracious he is to the nation of Israel. So, okay, Paul, what you're saying is my sin is a good thing, because it, it really glorifies God. In other words, if I'm faithless, it gives God an opportunity to show how faithful he is. If I'm unloving, it, it gives God the opportunity to show how loving he is. 
Oh, and, and if I lie, see, this is, this is what Paul is saying in verse 7, but if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I being judged a sinner? If my lie brings him glory, isn't that what we're supposed to do, Paul? Isn't that the point you're making here, Paul? That's twisted sinful logic is what that is. That is somebody that wants their sin. They don't want righteousness. That is somebody that's going to just reject God no matter what is said, no matter what happens. They're going to pervert it. They're going to twist it. And Paul is saying, I never said any such thing. As a matter of fact, he deals with it in detail in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. He asks, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? What these people are saying would be the equivalent of me saying, you know what? I think I want to go out and I want to start a house fire so that we can show how skilled the fire department is. Doesn't that sound right? Let's go out and let's burn some houses down so that we'll give the world the opportunity to see how skilled Pleasant View Fire Department really is. But here's what they're not thinking about. They're not thinking about the people that own that home. They're not thinking about the loss and the damage that's going to be done as a result of us setting fire to a house, possibly even loss of life. They're not thinking about that at all. But Paul does. And sin is every bit as destructive. Sin is every bit as destructive and harmful to people. Uh, and Paul gets it but they don't. And Paul is saying, look, this is the sin that is destroying you. This is the sin you need to repent of. This is the sin that ultimately is going to send you to hell. I'm not saying sin so that God is glorified. I never once said that. But the problem they're having is that religious people cannot accept grace. Religious people cannot accept grace because religious people want to be in control. That's why they look to rules and laws. I do this. I don't do that. My heritage, my relationship with the church. They point towards all the things they do as making them right with God, but they don't point to what God does to make them right with him. It's not about us doing something to make us right with God. It's about what God does in us to make us right with him. And that involves repentance of sin. And that's what Paul has been teaching all along, that the religious, ritualistic Jew cannot, will not understand. They reject grace. Because the option of grace is just impossible for some people to accept. That's why they constantly point to their good works as what makes them right with God. So Paul says, yes, there's great advantage to being a Jew. I never said there wasn't. Yes, God has given amazing, wonderful promises. I never said he didn't. But you misunderstand that being God's chosen people is a responsibility, not a privilege. You need to repent just as the rest of the world does. God's promises, the conditional ones, you're not obeying them anyhow, so they don't apply to you but all the other ones you think automatically make you win. That's to the nation of Israel as a whole, the true spiritual nation of Israel, which you are not a part of because you are rejecting the required faith to believe in God. You are rejecting repentance. And now you've gone so far as to try and justify your sin by saying, well, my sin makes God look good, therefore it's perfectly fine what we're doing. And Paul says, no, it's not. Notice what he says at the end of verse 8. Their condemnation is just. That's Paul's point. They're condemning their self, and God's wrath upon them is perfectly just. Mm. Well, he moves to another group, and, and this is where it's going to hit home for us. Verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Who's the we? Christians. Paul now moves to the Christians in Rome that he's writing the letter to. And he's asking, are we better than all of them? Are we better than the Gentile? Are we better than the Jew because we're in Christ? Notice what he says, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. 
And then Paul gives a breakdown of depravity. And he uses an Old Testament scripture. And then he finally, and I don't know if we'll get there. We're, we're going to try. Remember that the goal for the bad news Paul is getting to is chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's sort of the summation of the first three chapters and 23 verses. We're getting there. But now he's turning to the Christian and asking, are we better than they? Because we're in Christ? No, not at all. Because we've all sinned. Jew and Greek are all under sin as it is written. And um, the psalm that, that he chose um, there in verse um, David, David gets it he gets it he, he has an understanding of man's depravity as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write these words and uh, we'll look at them and we'll break them down and we'll see in verse 19 how the law applies so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God which we are the whole world is Verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. If you believe the law, if you believe keeping rules makes you right with God, well, what you're doing is you're just acknowledging that you're sinning and you know you're sinning. Because you can't keep the rules. But we'll cover that a little bit more next week. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word. And Father, I pray that you take these words and run them through the, through the filter over our hearts that your Holy Spirit so graciously puts there. Uh, take, take any words of man out and may your pure words uh, be what sinks, what sinks in. And um, that's what we, what we feast upon, what we meditate upon. So Father, thank you for uh, grace Thank you that we can study your word and have a greater understanding of how rules will not bring us the salvation we need, how heritage, knowledge alone will not bring us the righteousness we need, but that righteousness only comes from your son, Jesus Christ. All of the Bible points to him and his work on Calvary. So, Father, help us accept grace, I pray. Help us understand it. And, Father, bring glory to your name, not by our sin, of course not. Bring glory to your name by your work in us as you deliver us from sin. So, Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.